Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the World Green Building Council uh, Middle East and Africa Congress. My name is Francis Kimani from Kenya Green Building Society, and I am the programs officer at the World, at the GBC. And my name is Dominika Trewinska. I am the director of engagement and networks at the World Green Building Council, and I'm actually just filling in for Hin from Jordan Green Building Council, who will be your co MC and joining us momentarily. Now, Francis and I are very excited for the next two days as we're going to be hearing from a wide range of presentations and panels, and they're gonna be taking us beyond buildings across the Middle East and Africa. Oh, thank you, Dom. So uh, what does beyond buildings look like? Well, Francis, last year at COP26, World GBC released two reports. One of them was Beyond Buildings, which looked at integrating infrastructure and buildings in order to deliver a sustainable built environment. And the other one was Beyond the Business Case, which explores the broadening value proposition of sustainable buildings. Now together, these reports expand our scope from buildings to a more holistic built environment. And we'll hear more about that throughout the course of the next two days. Uh, but Francis, which sessions are you most interested to hear about today? Uh, so for me, um, the, you know, the built environment is such an important part of addressing both the causes and impacts of climate change. And I believe there are numerous opportunities between buildings and infrastructure to accelerate climate action at a scale and speed demanded by science. So I'm very keen to hear how leaders in the region are going about this. How about you, Dom? Well, I have to say that having been involved in the development of World GBC's sustainable reconstruction and recovery framework, I'm so excited to see the launch later today. So that is definitely the session that I am looking forward to hearing more from. Great, great. Uh, I can't wait. But before we jump into our opening remarks, I'd like to say a special thank you to Majid Al Futaim who make this annual Congress possible and have been the founding World GBC, MENA and Africa Regional Partners and DA Group who have recently joined as partners this year. And also a big thank you to our patron, Yusuf Nasif, who is the Climate Adaptation Director at the UNFCCC. Uh, Francis, anything else before we get going? Yes, Dom, yes, Dom. Just a quick housekeeping point before we get started. Uh, so uh, to the audience, we'd love to hear from you. Our participants, uh, so say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, so if at any point you're having technical difficulties or are not sure where to go, you can access the IT help desk through the expo located on the panel to your left. So the red dot on the vertical panel to your left hand side tells you where you should be based on the agenda. And all sessions taking place on the main stage, uh, there will be networking breaks where you can chat and get to know other event participants. Uh, uh, lastly, on the expo floor, uh, you can get to know projects and GBCs in the region. Well, with that, I think we're ready to go. What do you think, Francis? Sure, let's do it. So to officially open Congress, we'd like to welcome World GBC CEO, Christina Gamboa for her opening remarks. Christina, the stage is all yours. Hello everyone, and welcome to the first day of our fourth edition of the Middle East and Africa Green Building Congress. I am Cristina Gamboa, the CEO of the World Green Building Council, and it is my pleasure to be here with you today. At the heart of the World Green Building Council's mission, sustainable built environments for everyone everywhere, is an appreciation for the diversity of the buildings and infrastructure all across the globe, and of course, of the communities they support and serve. That is why our annual Middle East and Africa Green Building Congress is such an important event for our network, movement, and industry. This is a platform where we can, firstly, create conversations to further refine our knowledge around the diverse needs of the built environments in the Middle East and Africa under a changing climate. And secondly, to identify unique solutions in parts of the world that needs to adapt more urgently and at scale. The Middle East region is heating at twice the rate of the global average and is the most water stressed region in the world. And according to the IPCC, Africa is projected to have between a four to six degree temperature rise, meaning that the continent is heating at three times the rate of the global average. A few weeks ago, a cyclone made landfall in Mozambique 
displacing thousands of people in Southern Africa. And meanwhile, there's also droughts going on in East Africa, which may lead to at least 9 million people to face acute food insecurity. So as we head into COP27, the United Nations Annual Climate Summit, which is going to be hosted in Egypt this year in 2022, the impact of climate change in the Middle East and Africa regions cannot be ignored. And I hope these warnings instill as much concern in you as they do in me. This is our chance to avoid the worst of the climate breakdown. We don't have to wait until we're backed in a corner before we make the right choices. We can think with integrity and act with integrity. This is our chance to take action right now. And in order to do that, we need to go beyond buildings. Over the next two days, we will initiate conversations and collaboration that address both sustainable infrastructure as well as buildings. Last year, World GBC launched the Beyond the Business Case report at COP26 in Glasgow. And this report is a response to the broadening value proposition of a sustainable built environment that has to include ethical and financial incentives. It also, the report identifies social value as well as policy change, financial regulations, and of course, ESG reporting as the drivers of today's business case for sustainable built environment. And to accompany that report, we also launched another one called Beyond Buildings, because 75% of the infrastructure needed by 2050 is still to be built. And as a global need for infrastructure investment is forecast to reach $94 trillion by 2040, we need to act in a systemic way. Because... Buildings cannot be decarbonized without infrastructure. And that report, Beyond Buildings, demonstrates how integrated and interdependent those systems are, how sustainable buildings and infrastructure are linked to each other, and we can do much better. So with these two reports, Beyond the Business Case, Beyond Buildings, we're also very pleased to be launching in this Congress a new framework in close collaboration with our partners from EBRD, UN Habitat, and our GBCs in Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine, today we're launching a sustainable reconstruction and recovery framework. The framework is a toolkit for building back better in disaster struck areas and support our network's efforts and commitment to ensuring that sustainability is integrated in the reconstruction process. Despite the challenges, we believe there is a way to build back in a way that we can allow communities and economies in nature to thrive together. And of course, as we go into the opportunities we have to continue to bring awareness on resiliency and climate action, we have the opportunity to gain insights directly from our network at this Congress. At COP26, we saw some great collaboration and key players bringing one voice and one ambition on what it means to bring sustainability and decarbonization goals into the built environment. And as we work on the opportunities to have our message heard at COP27, we will be exploring how to continue to frame what are the priorities, what is the emphasis, and really make a difference for our movement and the quality of life of the region and beyond. So I would like to finish by extending our gratitude to our long-standing regional Congress partner, Majid al Futaim, and also extend a very warm, warm welcome to our new MENA and Africa regional partner, DAR Group. And of course, we look forward to working together with each one of you, sharing your perspectives, and of course, sharing between all of us, our expertise, knowledge, and the willingness to act with speed and scale. So I do hope you all enjoy the high level discussions and the content of the next two days. And I encourage you to join our efforts by working with our Green Building Councils to accelerate sustainable built environments for everyone, everywhere. Thank you and enjoy this Congress. Thank you, Christina, for those remarks and your dedication and leadership uh, of this important global movement. Uh, just so before we move on, I'd like to uh, give a short shout out to uh, the countries in the comment session. 
I can see uh, we have uh, attendees joining from Egypt, Cameroon, Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. And if you're just joining us, feel free to go into the comment section and tell us where you're from um, as we go on. So this year, we are honored to have uh, Youssef Nasef, Adaptation Director at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as the patron of our Congress. Youssef possesses 30 years of experience in diplomacy and international environmental policy, and is a seconded diplomat from the Egyptian Foreign Service. And so I would like to welcome Youssef to the stage to share his remark. The floor is yours, Youssef. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, regardless of where you are. I'm very happy to be addressing today the Middle East and Africa Green Building Congress. We are at a turning point in history, at least in the history of climate change policy. You often hear that we reach a point in, in history where plugging holes into problems will not necessarily be viable much longer, and that it's a time for a rethinking of all our policies and all our actions. We are in that stage in climate change action. It's time for a paradigm shift. Normally, such shifts happen when a big traumatic event happens, a world war, for example. In this case, we are confronted by an issue that approaches us very slowly. You don't really see it coming instantly. We are seeing the data, we're seeing the science, but it's not as visible to everybody in this world as, for example, COVID-19 has been, which has prompted immediate action. Now, we have two invisible hands helping us in moving forward the climate change discourse. One is the science, which is now unequivocal in terms of uh, alerting us to the direct impact of human activities on the phenomenon of global warming. We know that for sure, and we know that there are impacts that are already attributable to climate change. The second invisible hand is that of the rapid decline of the cost of renewables, which is pulling us slowly in that direction. And I said slowly, so it is not fast enough for us to take advantage of that very small window that we have in the next few years to put effect to that transformation. Now, why does that inertia exist? And this is also relevant for the built environment. One reason is that of stranded assets. Economically, in order to make the transformation, it means we will, we will leave a lot of the resources in the ground, resources that are perceived to have economic value. Now, the second thing, which is related to the first one, is the very slow depreciation uh, that is estimated to happen to long-life infrastructure projects. And so there's less of an incentive to replace those unsustainable built structures with ones that are green. The third one, to which I alluded to a bit in the beginning, is that of cognitive biases. There is a lot of framing of the problem. A lot of the framing leads us to defer action. For example, the notion of you know, the example of throwing a frog into boiling water and it jumps out right away versus throwing it in uh, water that is rapidly, uh, slowly heating up and the frog stays there till it dies. That's one of the cognitive biases we face through um, uh, the impacts of climate change that are not as visible, as readily visible as other problems. Um, we have something called the bystander effect, where even if you are really intent on doing something and you know that the problem is real and that there is urgency, we tend to say, hey, yeah, we believe in it and maybe someone should do something about it as long as the someone is not me. Um, now the Middle East and Africa, those regions offer a lot of opportunities. There are commonalities across countries in, in these regions. Um, for example, their contribution, their historical contribution to emissions is very low for all countries in the region. Um, the opportunities for using renewables are very, very high. 
whether in terms of solar, wind, or hydroelectric power. And finally, the opportunity for leapfrogging, moving away from current economic systems to one that is postmodern, one that is totally green, is probably much easier in this region than anywhere else. Now, in terms of differences, I think that they center on the types of impacts that will be um, experienced by the different countries in the regions. For some, it is sea level rise. For others, it is drought. For others, it might be uh, um, more extreme temperatures or floods. And each of these presents a nuanced uh, situation for how we design our built environment in the future. So while we might have a certain common set of values in how we transform our living environments, we still have to have that sort of mass customization where um, each part of this region will need special attention to respond to whatever new climatic zone it is, it is uh, going towards. Um, but to effect that transformation, we need to fix a few mindset constraints. One is our tendency to frame the issue through a negative angle. So we're seeing this as a problem requiring a solution. It's a reactive mindset. Um, a better option than that would be to go into a creative design mentality where we're trying to create a positive future regardless of what problems we have. And look at climate change just as one of many symptoms of another underlying problem, which is the way we conduct our socioeconomic systems. Um, another one is assuming that the future is a facsimile of the present plus a climate change signal. Whereas we know that we are on the cusp of a massive technological paradigm shift, where the future is not going to look anything like the present or the past all the way from new material science, which is particularly important for the built environment, to AI, to big data, Internet of Things, satellite technology, biotechnology, there's a massive transformation happening. And we need to visualize the opportunities provided by these tools to reach a sustainable future, to harness the ideas that we have into what the world should look like without anchoring it necessarily into today's system. So we create new systems. So you don't have necessarily cities versus rural areas. It might be a totally different thing. You take advantage of, uh, of new um, regenerative food production methods, and maybe the food production of a certain community will happen within walking distance of everyone living. So one has to have that creative mindset to look at this. And um, the World uh, Green uh, Building Council has, um, has a transformative agenda centered on climate change, on health and well-being, and on circularity and resources. And these are great entry points for transformation. And we've seen the report beyond the business case um, by the Council, which really has the tenets of transformation of our economic systems from one that prioritizes the bottom line, the financial bottom line, maximizing shareholder equity, to one that maximizes social values. And that is an amazing entry point that we need to build on. So my challenge to you now is how do we move from saying that cities are part of the solution to saying that the design of future living areas would lead the world towards a regenerative paradigm, a paradigm of ab abundance, where each human adds more value to nature than they take away from us. Then, finally, looking at our negotiating process, the climate change negotiations, Glasgow COP26, um, which is our negotiating session that took place the end of, uh, of last year, it closed a chapter of negotiations. We were setting up the rules for implementing the Paris Agreement. Now we're in a new phase where we need to discuss what is the meaning of transformation. And a huge part of that conversation will have to center on the built environment. And I rely on you, through your Middle East and Africa Congress, to actually help us understand what would be the tenets of this transformation and how can we take on board your ideas in advising the policymakers of how 
to shift that paradigm. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Thanks very much for you, Dom, for filling in for my place. My name is Hind Hadidi. I'm Acting Executive Director at Jordan Green Building Council. I will be also your MC uh, along with Francis. I would like to thank Yusuf for the very insightful remarks. The region indeed needs to collectively build the way towards a bold, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable recovery, one that empowers as many people as possible and harnesses our natural resources to transform to a green future. And finally, we would like to welcome Ibrahim Zabi to the stage. Ibrahim has been a longtime champion of the sustainability movement in our region and globally. He is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Majid al Fulaim Holding, a board member of the Emirates Green Building Council, and the chair of the World GBC Corporate Advisory Board, amongst other international responsibilities, of course. We are honored to have his leadership and support for our Congress today and uh, in the past. Ibrahim, the stage is yours. Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to the 4th World GBC Middle East and Africa Green Building Congress. This year's Congress is yet another special one as the attention of the environmental community turned to the region with COP27 and COP28 coming to Egypt and the United Arab Emirates, two very special milestones in the regional and global environmental agenda. I am also extremely excited about this year's theme as we go beyond the built environment and explore deeper integration of infrastructure and buildings with focus on building more resilience and capabilities to adapt and prepare for current and future challenges in a post-COVID-19 world. The biggest shaping influence of 2021 was the global pandemic and associated efforts around protection of lives and well-being, uh, vaccinations and economic recovery. 2022 will undoubtedly be filled with moments that will shape the world this year and for years and perhaps decades to come. It saddens me though that unfortunately, until now, this year will be remembered by an act of military conflict and people getting hurt and communities destroyed. Our prayers and thoughts are with all individuals. This war and other wars are impacting. As a human being first, before a sustainability practitioner, I hope this stops today. In the realm of protecting the environment, we see some positive indicators this year, starting with what the UN Environment Agency called the most significant environmental deal since the Paris Accord, as governments signed the first Global Plastic Pollution Treaty. We also see organizations unlocking capital and integrating ESG into their businesses and their strategies, and more net zero commitments globally. We see more startups focusing on climate action and climate tech solutions, as well as investments in VCs regarding such startups. I look forward to hearing about your 2022 renewed perspectives around net zero net positive, science-based targets, nature-based solutions, insights as well from everyone. Our discussions and our efforts in the green building space continue to be catalysts for smart urbanizations and sustainable development of cities, besides climate change mitigation, energy transition conversation, and allowing for new economic and job opportunities. I am also very excited to have our colleague Youssef Nasif, Climate Adaptation Director at UNFCCC, as our patron for this year's Congress. This is a critical time to work together to accelerate conversations, education and solutions that focus on how the places where we spend our lives, time can enhance and improve health. I look forward to the coming few days, which I am sure will be rich of insights and mind-opening conversations. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day ahead. Thank you.
So thank you once again, Christina, Yusuf, and Ibrahim for your inspirational words and for framing the discussions we'll be having over the course of the next two days. And with that, stay right here for our first session starting in just a moment.